without, without further ado, ado welcome. welcome. Nobody's Nobody saying where they're from, or have I just not got that up? <laughs> where are you? So I'll tell you where we are. I'm in Norfolk, in Winterton on Sea, and Claire is in Cheshire. What part of welcome, Claire? Claire is uh, Mrs. Burt. <laughs> I've just okay, met um, Mr. Burt. So whereabouts are you in Cheshire, Claire? So at um, the farm where we, um, the dairy is in Nutsford, uh, well, just outside Nutsford um, in Cheshire. And I actually live in Altrincham, so um, a little Fantastic. bit away. Fantastic. Really lovely, lovely part of the world. And so let's talk about a little bit about your background and how how did you get into cheese you know why where did you where where did you begin your cheese journey before you became a cheese maker <laughs> um i started um well originally did a um was in sort of a product development for uh for, for a food business um and then ended up at dairy gold food ingredients in uh at one of the uk sites in crew and it was a business to business um, operation. They took typically um, their cheddar from Ireland in block block cheddar, and they brought it across um, to the to the site in in, in crew. And they um, would typically grate it or slice it um, into a format that then would be used in a ready meal or um, in a sandwich or some in somewhere in the food industry. Wow! So my role there was, um, I suppose, it was a bit bit sort of technical sales um, understanding how the products how the cheeses worked for our different customers and that involved um, understanding about cheese and also I was very lucky to go and visit quite a few dairies um, across Italy um, Denmark and Ireland and the UK so it was a it was a great role it was, it was a lot so we buying cheese. cheeses from those dairies in Europe as well. Yeah, so we would act as well as a as a sort of um, bringing in different cheeses from. So you, we might buy mozzarella from um, from Arla, for example, and that would be like a block mozzarella, which would melt on you know going to pizza manufacturers. Yeah. Or we'd be buying more authentic, um, perhaps mozzarella, the boccaccinis from Italy, and that might be going to a salad manufacturer. So there was different levels of of um, of sort of different types of cheeses. Fantastic, but really, you know, massive scale, huge scale. Yeah, I think we were. I think at one point they were grating around about. I think it was about four hundred ton a week at, at, at Dairy Gold and Crew. Wow. And bearing in mind that I, we produce nine ton a year. <laughs> <laughs> Where you are now? Scale. Yes, <laughs> yeah. And so I know. Um, I mean, so I'm just going to fill you in. Apparently, the chat is disabled. I'm not sure how to undisable it, it folks. So I will pick up your Q and A's in a minute. Um, and thank you for telling us where you're from. Um, I don't know how we've managed to disable the chat, but I will try and work it out. Uh, but we have people here. Simon in New Zealand. Um, okay. So chat is disabled everybody's saying chat is disabled really sorry so we've got Anne is here from Belgium hello Anne lovely to see you we've got Barbara from Portugal Mike from Pennsylvania amazing amazing um Nikia from Stratford upon Avia Sandra from Bosnia and Jackie from North Wales and mate thank you welcome welcome everyone and I'm sorry about the disabled chat put your questions in there and I will pick them up when I'm not nattering away to Claire. So Claire and I met many years ago when I was a sales rep for cheese in Cheshire when I was working for Harvey and Brockless. And um, one of my customers was the Cheshire Smokehouse. And Claire, you bumbled in one day with your cheese that was handmade on the handmade on the kitchen table at that stage, I think. Well. I think it very it was, much was. And I think um, Cheshire Smokehouse were one of our very first um, customers, um, you know, and still still one of our customers. Um, and I did, yeah, bumble along with my sort of mouldy looking cheese. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, Darren and um, uh, had, you know, said, yeah, we'd love to try it and tried it and said, yeah, let, let's put it in. And I suppose that's the beauty of a kind of an independent. They said, yeah, let's put it put it in the um, in the fridge and it, it seemed to sell well. <laughs> Counter, it did. I think the local element really helped. So 
you were mate you you were passion for cheese you just were doing that as a hobby on the kitchen stay, table while still working for Kerry for Kerry Gold uh yeah but for Derek it was Kerry Derek, Gold so um, yeah um I suppose one of one of the lovely things about uh, the role was I went to Reese Heath College and I'd done oh, some okay. cheese making courses so I did the uh, soft cheese making course I did a grading course and the hard cheese making course so within that role um you know, I got to understand, I suppose, the principles of making cheese, although I wasn't actually making cheese, um, to, you know, day to day. And it was just it's just such an easy thing, I think, to to become very passionate about, because, you know, if you enjoy that sort of process and yeah. So, I yeah, I did just start playing about at home, really, and stumbled upon a cheese that um, I just liked. I think, um, you know, soft, soft blue is is a very lovely thing. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Well, not everybody likes blue, though. So it's quite an unusual cheese to start with. I know. I think perhaps in hindsight, I, you know, there might have been easier um, sort of cheeses to make. But I think any cheese has its quirks and challenges. You know, I don't think there's a, yeah, a quick. So were you a blue cheese fan then when you? Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, it would have been one of my favourite, favourite picks on a cheese board. Fantastic. And then... So what elevated you from that kitchen table um, onwards to uh, On onwards, create, uh, create Bert's Cheese? Company? I suppose it was, um, I guess at the time I was um, I actually would, um, was pregnant with um, my first and um, the role the role at Dairy Gold, although it being fantastic, involved a lot of travel. So I'd be up and down seeing customers um, and it didn't, I couldn't really see how that role might fit with um, a young family. So um, I had gone back to work part time and I guess my heart wasn't perhaps in it as much um, as much as it had been. Um, and yeah, I suppose it coincided as well with my husband. He took a bit of a promotion at work. They felt like there might be a bit more opportunity to sort of meet a, well, it probably wasn't an opportunity, but I sort of took the opportunity to maybe say perhaps I could, um, yeah, leave, leave, not essentially leave work, but perhaps start something new. and. Uh, yeah, in high, I don't know whether ignorance is bliss when you start something, to be honest with you. If I'd thought it through and thought through everything that was involved in terms of time and money and cash flow and the ups and downs of starting a business, net, let alone making, you know, learning still how to make cheese, it wasn't and bring up the most family. sensible option with a young and family. Bring, yeah, but, and bring you know. up a family. Oh, what a very lovely husband. So yes. he, he, he facilitated some of the uh, cash flow then he did yes as I think as a family with he's uh yeah do not only the cash flow I suppose it's the time involved as well when you when you're yeah. starting out the sort of the, the yeah it's a bit all all consuming isn't it when you it is and it's just um people don't realize well you've got to be a, a master of lots and lots of uh, of different skills haven't you so yeah. fair play to you and so what year was that so that was um, 2010, I'd gone back to work um, and that's when I entered, um, I had sort of started making a little bit of cheese um, and that's when I entered into the in, the International Cheese Awards at Nantwich. Okay. Um, as it was. Um, and we, I picked up a gold um, that year. Wow. So maybe it wasn't so much, you know, it's nice to, it's nice to win a gold, of course it is, but it was more along the lines of if my cheese can stand up against all those other cheesemakers, maybe you know, there's a. I've got something there that you know. Still, is, yeah. Work with. So um, it sort of snowballed from there. Really, I gave up um, left Dairy Gold in 2011. The sort of the January, um, and then found a little, a very small premises at the back of a cookery school, which was just our room. Um, it was a very small room. It started at, I think it's it was basically at the side of their building, so it started at two and a half meters. And then it tapered to about a metre. <laughs> oh, wow. Tunnel, tunnel down towards the maturing room. So you had a very long, thin vat. Very long, thin. Everything was <laughs> one of those like sort of ship's kitchens, maybe. <laughs> yes. Um, but what that did was allow me to, to scale up and start making cheese and, you know, start taking it out to customers and, and, and take it from there, really. So cool and to begin with you were just selling to individual um independents yeah so not not through any wholesalers 
No, um, not through any wholesalers. It was just um, people like sort of uh, Cheese Hamlet over at Didsbury. John, oh, John and Arthur, yes. No, yes, no. John and Arthur, and, and then Carol at the cheese shop um, in Chester. Chester and yeah. fact, when I first started making, I was still making like the little, just the little baby truckles that we do. So oh, yes. The, just the little ones. Um, and it was Carol at the cheese shop that suggested, you know, a, for her, you know, a, a bigger cutting, like more sort of a deli style cheese. So hence then, the, you know, things evolved and we started making the bigger, the bigger cheeses, which, which are these. Um, now. Which is a completely different process as well, isn't it? Because it completely changes the whole um, yeah. texture. The drainage, from, really. Sorry? Just from a drainage point of view. Yes. Yes. In making. And um, yeah, and then you write down how, how it matures and then the textures. Oh, and yeah. Maybe, so. yeah. Do you still make the small cheeses though? Yeah. Cool. And then, so. Tell us, because what we've done tonight, folks, is uh, Claire had put on sale. She's been in holiday in France, so she's amazing. She's cracked on with, with sorting all this out for us, but she's shipped a load of boxes out to various people. So I hope lots of people have got their cheese in front of them. And tell us about your the journey now, because they've got two different profiles, haven't they? of Burt's Blue, which is Burt's Blue is the original cheese, isn't it? Burt's Blue is our sort of our, our mainstay as well. I mean, it's our biggest volume in terms of what we do. We do all the, you know, sort of monthly specials that might take to a market and sell through the odd independent, but really it's the Burt's Blue and then it's, the Duncan as well a little bit. Yeah, so Burt's is your signature cheese. So yeah. tell us the journey of, of you know, of Burt's Blue and, and, and where where it's gone because obviously that's really interesting that you started with the little tiny ones which were manageable in your small space but now um through re customer requests which is amazing you've gone to the cutting one but you know how, you've been going what it's making cheese 11 12 years seriously yeah and i spoke well i suppose yeah 2011 was sort of the real kickoff of of it being a full-time um business or or job um, yeah, uh, I suppose, and then we moved on to the farm, moved from the cookery school and onto the farm in 2013, and that's when I took on Tom, who's still still on board. Um, so tell it, who's Tom? Tom's your cheese maker, then? Yes. So uh, there's still uh, two of us in the business, uh, Tom and I, and um, so yeah, Tom joined in 2013, and um, he was a chef, sort of chef by um, previous trade, as it were. Yeah. And we tried our Burt's Blue um, through a wholesaler that had come on site and they'd done a, a tasting and uh, he sort of realised that we were quite local. Come down and and um, when I was actually at the cookery school and showed just a, an interest, really. Um, right. And he was keen and passionate. And um, yeah, when I, when I sort of grew up, um, when we grew onto the farm, I thought, well, the opportunity was then, again, it was sort of having somebody there that could support me. Uh, on a full-time basis so Tom came on board and well it's such I'm physical doing. work as well isn't it it's such physical work it and for one person it is who's running a family and um, a house and everything else to continuously make cheese do you make cheese every day now um I'd say we're up to about sort of four we will be up to five days a week uh running the run to Christmas so right up to Christmas, I was gonna say, it's just going to start getting bigger now isn't it it, is, it just starts to get bigger um but yeah, it, it is it is a physical job. I think that is uh, one thing about it. It you know it's yeah. it can be a tiring day in the dairy. It's not you know, and it's it's you're constantly on the move. Once you start that process, is what which is what I quite like about it. When you start it, you know the vats full, and you start the process, then it doesn't really end until you get to you know the end of the day. And I quite like that busyness and the momentum and the routine of it all. I enjoy that. Yes. Uh, that's good because uh, that is uh, that I mean I think that is a skill in itself and then all the washing up <laughs> I have to I'm ask this of every, I have to ask <laughs> of every cheesemaker so have you got a dishwasher I, I well we've got a small domestic um dishwasher which we do the molds through but um other than that there is a there is a lot of washing up yeah oh bless you <laughs> 
<laughs> That'll be the next bit of investment. Yes, yes. Fantastic. So tell <laughs> us about the journey of Burt's Blue and what people have got to taste tonight. Okay, so what, I, think we've got, um, I think certainly over the last 12 months, we've really been, but well, I think the cheese making never really stops. So we know we've learned so much um, each year. We seem to, something different changes um, and with a new challenge or we, we challenge ourselves to do something different and better. And I think we're always trying to just get to that point where the customer gets the, the you know the, the best version of our cheese. So we used to sell our cheese out quite young, I would say, and possibly mm. um, a bit naively, maybe um, still learning about sort of customers and their requirements, but also where our cheese goes. So whereas before we'd go direct, more direct to customers, now we're going through a lot more wholesalers. So right. wholesalers will you know pick up our cheese. They might then want to hold it for a week or two, or it might go straight out to a customer. So it's understanding, I suppose, now where our cheese goes and what journey it goes on. And I then it's got a lot more awareness of affinage now as well. I mean, not bigging up our affinage of the year competition, but that is such a massive thing now for cheese mongers as well. So you've got Paxton and Whitfield recently have created maturing rooms in their Borton facility, in their warehouse in Borton. They have got maturing rooms underneath their German street shop, but that's very limited space. So you've got a lot of cheesemongers now creating mm. spaces so they can mature the cheesemakers' cheeses longer. And I suppose keeping tabs of that must be quite hard. Yeah, so that, that's been the biggest challenge this year. We've been trying to hold our products for longer and understand how they change. So whereas we would have released a cheese as a lot younger, um, yes. you know, the difference between a customer trying this at eight weeks and it's it's got lots of characteristics that lots of people like. It's, you know, got a bit more of a lactic note. It's, uh, it's quite fresh. It's got a, a much milder blue flavour versus something that we've then aged and developed um, you know and held and held back uh yeah. this now at sort of at 14 weeks the paste is completely broken down through you know you, you get so much the flavors change quite dramatically i think over yeah. the two and quite fudgy or and, and and yeah sort of quite biscuity and quite caramel um compared to sort of i mean even within the paste you can see how it's not fully broken down it's got it's beginning to go you've yeah. got that sort of silkier sort of glisten underneath the rind but he'll still here is very um very sort of chalky I guess but some and, people... and, and I mean a lot of people will at that stage get quite a lot of bitterness from the blue so the blue won't the blue yes. actually mold in the cheese hasn't mellowed at all yes. can be quite bitter and quite peppery yeah. Uh, would you say that's how would you describe your young cheese, the blue side of it? I think certainly the bitter notes um, just mellow. Oh, you know, you can you, there's a definite uh, fall off of, of the bitter notes. And I think sometimes because I think bitter and, and lactic notes get a bit, you know, sometimes they can clash a little bit, but sometimes yes. it can be quite nice as well. You know, like a blue Cheshire, that sort of, yeah, it's, it's a different to a sort of a, a soft blue, isn't it? Yes, yes. That mouthfeel yeah. as well. That, um, I think because the, the mouthfeel on the more mature cheese is, is smoother, the paste is smoother, it's more broken down. I think that, again, it how your mouth perceives that as well is different. Those okay. Flavors. And I'm going to do, there's a few questions here in the chat, so I'm just going to have a look at these. So we've got um, Judith from sunny Vancouver in Canada. Hi, Claire. It's Judith from Level oh. 2. Hi, Judith. <laughs> and hi, Tracy. Thanks to whomever for the notification that chat is disabled. I thought it was only me. So you've been doing your academy courses then. And so I'm assuming, who did you do your Level 2 with then? Uh, with Patrick. Patrick ah, McGuigan. with Patrick McGuigan. So obviously online. Yes. Which so, is a wonder of online learning. Um, amazing. And you learned with Claire in Canada. No, you were with Judith in Canada. Exactly. I know. And I think that was the, the great thing about being able to do it online because, you know, finding time in the day and, you know, taking time out of work or life and traveling and all those things. But being able to, you know, jump on a Thursday evening, 
I know, and taste cheese. Amazing. Cheese Hello, cheese lovers. Yeah. Fellow <laughs> cheese lovers. Yeah. Fellow cheese lovers and cheese makers. I don't know if Judith is a cheese maker or if she's a consumer or just a cheese lover. You'll have to let us know, Judith. <laughs> Sorry, I think she's a, a, a passionate, you know, cheese, yes, cheese, cheese lover and lover. consumer. Fantastic! <laughs> We've got lots of people who are joining us from Canada at the moment on the courses, and so from your point of view as a cheese maker, um, what do you think? I know level one is fairly basic, and uh, for someone who's already learned about cheese, but you do discover and taste lots of other cheeses because, as you've already admitted, you make blue cheese, and there's that oh. whole other families. It's, it's, you know, I think that's the, the biggest thing for me was, you know, you can learn and read about cheese and you can learn. There's so many different aspects though of cheese making or, you know, like affineur, like you were talking about, but then there's, you know, sort of how you taste cheese, how you pair cheese. And I think, and, but when you make cheese as well, you know, I, I know lots about Burt's Blue. <laughs> yes. But, you know, you can become very just sort of, yeah, within your own sort of dairy and what, you, what you're doing. But I think, the opportunity to try and try cheeses with other people and um yes. and learn you just, I just I learned a lot from the course it's not just cheese making it was for me it was about understanding about different cheeses I thought it was fascinating I know it sounds a bit bizarre but we talked a lot about the different rinds on cheeses yes and I'm slightly obsessed about mold rinds and looking at rinds and molds but I found, so I found that part of the course super interesting because the French cheeses you know the different the new core on some the wash drying the change of ph yeah i thought that was brilliant fantastic so. that's really good because i mean with that in mind tell us a little bit about your molds then because um you know you pierce burt's blue don't you hand pierce even so tell us about yeah. that because i've seen electronic piercing in action yeah in various visits to various cheesemakers, but I've never seen anybody hand pierce. Nobody's crazy enough to do it by hand. <laughs> um, yeah, Tell so us we, about it. Tell us yeah. all about it. So we um, developed uh, a little sort of four-pronged attack, so to speak. So it's a four-pronged skewered and it's moulded into a, like a little handheld white moulded uh, plastic. And that was one of the, uh, so I'd say, like I said before, you know, each year we've learned something different there was certainly yes. about probably about five years ago we spent a lot of time understanding piercing cheese and how we pierced it and you know what piercing worked and what piercing didn't and I think you know we used to go for sort of slightly bigger holes in yep. the thought that you know more oxygen would get in but then actually we realized it's about it's probably the, the frequency of numbers and that ability for the cheese to open up as you sort of you know if you if you're piercing it lots the cheese texture can open up more rather than just have sort of skewer marks through so that's what we found helped our cheese but it's you know it's different for every style of cheese so we go through the top you know still yeah. through the side so it just depends on yeah and your cheese is quite an unusual shape really it's is it is it do you use colanders as your we do yes. colanders, yeah because it's got that fantastic sort of spaceship shape hasn't yeah. it I have to be careful how I say that spaceship shape. Because <laughs> <laughs> the but the little birds blues um, yeah, again they're done by hand. See my hands. They're 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 just buttons, aren't they? They're round buttons. Yes, they're sort of um ninety camembert style. style. Yeah, that sort of yeah, so big shape. Um, and then yeah, they're all pierced by hand as well. So and do you pierce person. those from the top or the side? We've done both in the past um, okay. and we get good good piercing both ways on those. Um, it depends a little bit on the time of year and how many we've got to do and how quick we can do them. Um, <laughs> and how many glasses Christmas. of wine you've had the night before. <laughs> yes, and how, how angry are you feeling? <laughs> <laughs> Where is that element? Oh, now I know, now I know where to come. It's a good anger management. So. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. That's very um, funny. But yeah, I think we're, we're getting we're getting the blue we want now. I mean, you can see with the difference between the maturing as well of how that blue develops. But, you know, this, this one's probably lacking a little bit of blue still at eight weeks. Yeah. yeah you see it's beginning to. Yeah. And you can see a very yeah. strong vertical pierce on that, can't yeah. you? Yeah, you can. I suppose you get the you get the vertical lines of blue, but then you also get these like sort of blotches, I call of sort of like pockets of blue. 
And I guess that's where the curves just sort of naturally kind of opened up a little bit as you as you're piercing and dragging yeah. and pulling the textures yeah. out. And when you okay, I'm gonna ask this other question. I'm gonna ask you that in a minute because okay. we've got um so Anne, who is uh I met, um, I was very, very lucky to be inducted into the Guild des Fromages in Paris this earlier this year as a uh kind of a accolade for all my work in cheese over the years which is amazing so I got a beautiful um uh, medallion and scarf silk scarf and gorgeous and I met Anne there and she's the this Anne has managed to get cheeses onto the Belgium postage stamps now I have determined I'm going to do this in the UK and I've emailed a lot of people but I think I need to get on the phone to find the right people of how we can get iconic British cheeses onto postage stamps so watch this space everybody I'm going to try anyway um, Anne says is it your intention to sell your cheeses outside the UK I am teaching a masterclass on English cheese in Belgium and have a hard time getting specialities for example, I have tried to have your cheeses for this evening, but alas, how do you see this as a British producer? So it's a tough one, isn't it, at the moment? I know we are exporting cheeses. Yeah, I mean, for, for a business our size, it, it's difficult, I think, because, well, how much we can produce, um, but also then the, the extra work involved in in exporting, you know, from yes. a, you know, we so be able to get it there within a, in, a, in a timely manner and how it would travel you know transport costs even in the UK are expensive bearing up yes and, and chilled you know chilled couriers so you know for our bigger wholesalers that can take a bigger order we can put it on a chilled a chilled courier because you yes. can you know you can offset the price of the chilled courier per kilo yes and, and then we have wholesalers that come and collect from us obviously in their refrigerated vans um I mean and then we do we do dispatch obviously with ice packs um, and couriers, but so it's just about I suppose it's economies of scale as well. Well, and I think well, since it's... dare I say it, Brexit, there's there's mm. a lot of support for the British cheese, and people there's probably you can make enough to support what you're, the requirement for the British because you you supply booths, don't you, in the north? And for yeah. people who don't know, booths is a supermarket. That's people used to call it the waitress, right, waitros of the north, which I think used to really annoy them. Um, but they are a chain of supermarkets in the north that, uh, you know, support local su uh, producers, don't they? Is, and they've supported you in a fantastic way. I, I know that from having worked with one of their buyers. Um, so to be honest, that's quite a big quantity, I would imagine, of scale. I suppose the only way is someone like the Fine Cheese Company, who can be, say. yeah, do you supply to them or not? supply the Fine Cheese Company and they have um, done a little bit of export for us, which I always find very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when our cheeses have, you know, somebody our size and our scale in our little, you know, unit. Yeah. Um, and our, you know, when, our, when they've exported our cheeses. But I suppose that's another relationship that, you know, that's for them to sort of, to, yeah, there's a lot of management around that. Yes. But and then, I think it's at that point of what, um, which is what we're talking about tonight, is is at what stage of blueing, of age profile that you send them because it's got to age while it's on, well, especially if the cheeses are going um, to America or Canada or, or the, Australia, obviously. I know that Stiltons go on very young so that the, they mature as they travel. Um, but with the fine, to get to Belgium, um, Anne, We'll get it to you. We'll talk to Fine Cheese Fine. Company because <laughs> Fine Cheese Company, they are doing a lot of uh, exporting to, I know, about 60 countries. I know Paxton Whitfield do some exporting as well. So it is it is finding that specialist small wholesaler that has got a selection of the uh, British speciality cheeses. But Anne, send me an email and we can talk about that as well. Um, oh. Judith is saying I'm not very loud. Oh. Is anybody else having trouble hearing me? I'm sorry, I'll, I'll try and be closer to my microphone. It's probably because I wave my hands about Judith. 
Um, right, Claire Lewis is saying, I love the eight week one with the lactic tone, almost like a Wensleydale. Oh. I remember Blue Wensleydale and they still make it. I was cracking cheese, Blue Wensleydale, wasn't it? But a bit more mass produced than yours. Yeah. So produce, presumably you're hand ladling into your molds and everything else. Yeah, yeah, we hand ladle. Um, so we start the process um, culturing and then we um, obviously cut by hand and then we, our, our vat is, you know, it's all, there's no, there's no mechanical stirrers. It's, um, it's all very much, you know, hand cut and then hand ladled. Um, so we, we do drain off a little bit of the whey. Yeah. Um, but we leave the curds in the way while we're scooping them out, while we're ladling them out. And then they get ladled and uh, put onto the draining table, which will drain um, during that drainage. They get turned a couple of times and then they're left overnight um, to sort of, um, and then they're turned again before they're demolded and salted. So we dry salt uh, day two. Okay, so there's no brining or anything, it's dry salting. We and how do you keep a control on that? I was talking to a cheese maker the other day who had, they they have much bigger production than you, but they'd mechanicalized, they're about to mechanicalize, is that a word? dry salting because right. they were finding they were getting lots of variation so yeah uh, it's um yeah i suppose is it a natural challenge but we do thing or we just yeah. use um we do each one individually so we it's it's time consuming we know we don't just sort of go across um we do do each one and we do that with a little sort of salt scoop um so it's not so bad on the large because obviously we can apply quite quickly the small, um, especially in the run up to Christmas because it's perfect for a hamper or you know a gift. Yes, um, they, they are time consuming. But um, and you get, I, I now have visions of you with the salt shaker. Who <laughs> 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 <Not laughs> your quite. baby Bert's blues? <laughs> <laughs> not shaking loads and loads no uh, so it's just little little like little scoop so it's like a little quick and then flipped over and a little quick yeah and around the sides and then it goes into the maturing tray so it, yeah and it talking is it is repetitive <laughs> it is a lot of cheese making it's repetitive yes. and talking of baby birds you've got two children haven't you I have yes yes boys or not girls so baby anymore I suppose Noah uh, is 12 going on 13 and Esme is nine going on 10 so oh both. fantastic yeah. lovely age. any interest in cheese oh so that was my <laughs> next question so are they there helping with the salt shaking i have had them in on occasion um but mostly to pack and label they're good they're good stickers yeah, yeah. that's stickers see, see, labeling is fun because it's stickers yes, isn't it? exactly as me likes sticking <laughs> Fantastic. Well, fair play to them. I hope you give them some pocket money. They do get pocket money for yes. Um, <laughs> okay, so we've got Roger is 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 um, voting for the fourteen week cheese, um, mm -hmm. saying well worth the extra maturation. And I in I haven't got the cheeses tonight, but I've tasted Claire's cheeses before, and I do like the more mature because I think that the curd becomes much softer and creamier, doesn't it? It does. I think they are too very different cheeses and I think if you bought Burt's Blue at eight weeks and you like that sort of lactic that sort of younger blue flavor um then and if you had you know at 14 weeks I think you'd be surprised almost it would be the same cheese, same cheese because you know it does become I quite like the 14 weeks when it's quite it, to me it goes a bit biscuity and I, you Ooh, know yeah. it's like sweeter notes I think come through on the flavor and, and and yes the paste is much smoother more broken down but then I also quite like the young, younger, fresher. And does the blue <laughs> get? Uh, does the blue get more spicy in the mature? Yeah, I think the blue, though it mellows in terms of bitterness, I think you do get more blue flavour. Yeah. Um. So it's a it's a different yeah it's a, it's a different different, different cheese. Fantastic. You could call it different cheese, and away you go. Another bird is born. Yeah. Um, okay, so Claire is, is is asking me the dreaded question of any news about level three. Oh. Yes, we're working away really hard at it. You will not believe. Um, in fact, we now have Katie, who's the education project manager, who is um, chasing herding herding lovely contributors um, who are helping us write all the material. The aim of the game is level three is modular. There's nine modules and you'll be able to buy modules separately. 
um, you have to do four core modules and four supplementary models. So there's eight modules you need to do to pass level three. And we're hoping to launch at least three of those in November, three of those modules. But we will be launching ding, 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 the 200 cheeses that you need to study at level three in November. Those will There will be a list and they will all be in the cheese library. So you can actually get cracking on finding those cheeses, sourcing those cheeses. And they are from all around the world. We have embraced every country. Well, most countries. I'm not going to say every country because someone will pull me up. So, Claire, it's coming. Thank you all for your patience. Um, we have to juggle the funding uh, to be able to bring that to you, but we're, we're, we're doing well. We're doing there. We're getting there. I feel like we're making progress. So, um, ah, good question from Beth here. What would you pair with each cheese? Oh, that is a good question. Um, so for the drunken bird, uh, with drunken bird, we haven't really talked about uh, the drunken bird's washed. Oh, out. do you want to tell us a bit about that? We've got it's eighteen forty. So okay. we've got, um, you know, we've got 10 minutes. Oh, okay. So the drunken bird's washed in cider. So, um, and we don't pierce the drunken. So we don't typically get any of the bluing. Although it might blue a little bit if you let, if it was left un uncut and as the oxygen would get to it, it may well blue a little bit in the, some of the pockets. So is there penicillium yes. mould in the, that yes. goes into the milk? Yes. Yep. So we've inoculated okay. it um, and it, we do encourage it on the surface. Although the wash will... The wash doesn't necessarily change the pH of the surface as much as on a typical wash dry cheese, but it will affect it a little bit, which is why you've got, you know, you have got other sort of colours and things going on on the surface. Um, so I would maybe pair that with, I don't know, some of the apple notes. If I was going to pair it with a drink, I might pair it with a, a cider or something. So we use uh, Guatkin cider, which is a Hereford mm. cider. So um, strong. Yes. They it talks all, from all Hereford. But yes, they always That's... used to be at Ludlow Food Festival, yes. which was my food festival from way back in the day when I had a delicatessen in Ludlow. And they, um, it's so strong, that cider. So is it a swig for the cheese and a swig for you? And, uh... oh, I'm not a big <laughs> cider fan, but Tom, Tom's from Hereford. Oh, um, is he? And hence why we use Gotkin cider, not a local cider, but... Um, it's always worked really well for us, and it, it's a it's it's a punchy one. <laughs> it is, and I would say that it's quite cloudy, isn't it? So I would mm. imagine there's quite a few things going on in there as well. Yeah. So, um, so I, yeah, maybe I'd pair that with a with a cider and go down. Yeah, that. but it's superb, apple root. And then the the two blues. I mean, yeah, I haven't really. If I'm honest, I've never thought about separating them out as two different cheeses. Maybe I should think about. But and so in yeah. terms of pairing. Um, I did something recently which was really really good that I took off Instagram it was ro um, sort of like caramelized roasted pineapple sort of in the oven oh yes um, with blue cheese was incredible yes <laughs> probably yeah. more with the 14 weeks one actually yeah I bet that's yeah. superb and I love I think a porter so a dark ale or a chocolatey porter stout was really good with blue cheese Ginger is lovely with blue cheese. So if you don't, if you're not, uh, don't drink alcohol, we love a ginger cordial um, okay. cheese or and make it up with sparkling water. Really, mm. really good. Um, but yes, I'm not sure about the, your lactic, more lactic note one. You're going to. Yeah, I suppose I haven't, as I say, not really thought about how we would pair that. But I mean, I think the classic things like, you know, pickle pears, we, um, there's a company um, that, that sort of forage forage for fruits and they, they call fruits of the forage and some people did actually add them onto their boxes so the pickled pears from fruits of the forage are incredible and mm -hmm. with our cheeses either cheese they would go really really well with um, i think as well and traditionally before we were all getting all foodie and all poncy foodie everybody put port with blue cheese didn't they Yes. But now I think a sweet dessert wine is lovely with blue cheese yeah. as well because it really brings out that biscuity and the and those um, you know the blue notes. So there's lots and lots. So hopefully that helps. Uh, what's Anne saying? Export uh, volumes okay. Sound is okay here. That's great. 
Sue is saying I like them both too. Very different, but both very tasty. Excellent. Uh, Anne has worked. Oh, she's saying she's worked with Fine Cheese Company as a purchaser, but the volumes are too large. So that's the difficult thing is that that volume of scale of, of those shipping costs. And now that every batch, every different cheesemaker's batch has to be have a vet certificate, which I believe, you know, is is 90 quid or something per certificate, isn't it? So when you add that on, knock it on effect to every bit of cheese. And let's talk anyway. So Jackie Whitaker um, is how big are your vats? do you have vats uh, i'd like to say we had vats we've only got one vat <laughs> um it's um the capacity is about uh 400 liters so it sounds a bit odd but we do try and squeeze a bit more in so we, we try and work with a lift, like just over 400 liters yeah it's full, we may as well get it as full as we can but capacity is 400 and your yeah. milk is coming from the farm where the the dairy now is where not you're... actually where the where the dairy is based but just a local farm so okay a single herd um yeah just not i don't think probably 10 miles down the road and is it frisian cows uh it's a mix actually it's a cross herd so there's the um, on Balliard, um oh, nice has some nice proteins um there's some uh, holstein and then there's a swedish red and maybe a few others sort of thrown in <laughs> but those are the those are the main yeah. ones yeah and you they you pasteurize the milk yeah or they, they pasteurize they actually it process you. the milk but they have a small they have a little uh, pasteurizer and um, so there that takes out the process for us as a startup business it was it was easier to evolve from that that position um but you know our vat could could potentially batch pasteurize we might look at that in terms of again the economies of scale and how things it, it works better works better for us fantastic and i was just saying to you earlier that you your how is the grass for the cows because there's been massive articles in the news about some of the cows in europe have not been able to have uh, yeah. there is no grass left for them to eat so it's really put having a knock-on effect on even pdo statuses which is really scary with the salad i read about that with the salad yeah then... so but it's how is it in cheshire not so bad i we're a little bit greener up here. We get a little bit more rainfall. That's the one yes. <laughs> where we are. Yes, but, um, near to yeah, Wales. It, yeah, it's, a, it's certainly a challenge. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think we're probably a little bit greener up here. That's good. So um, another question. What, and I was thinking of this one actually. So with the cheese whey, is there anything that you're able to do with that? I suppose because it's inoculated with blue. Yeah, it's a bit, a bit more tricky, isn't it? tends to go to a um, sort of a pig feed pig, pig feed yeah which is what a lot of um of of cheese makers do when it's lots so i'm going to whiz through these questions so we don't run out of time uh we'll be interested in knowing more about fine cheese co if they could export to australia okay simon um they have exported to australia That's yes our cheese has ended up there oh has it very excitedly Fantastic. <laughs> amazing well, um, I know that Neil's Yard Dairy have been working with the Australian government for a number of years to uh, get uh, the restriction lifted for raw milk cheeses being imported into Australia. So that's really exciting. I know you're pasteurised milk, but that's very exciting for some of the other artisan producers. Um, how many cheeses do you make per production? Okay. So we've answered the question about the litres you're doing about yes. 400 litres. So we do often do a split of small and large. Um, it's never it's never any uh, same thing every day, potentially. It depends a little bit on what customers are ordering, how much stock we've got. Um, but, you know, we can usually pull sort of, it's usually a split of maybe, I don't know, um, sort of 90 small and maybe 20, 28 large or something, or 24 large, yeah. depending a little bit on, on what we're doing. And Sue's saying, my drunken Bert doesn't look as soft as yours. She's getting drunken Bert envy now. Uh -huh. um, not, so it's the same it's batch. Not it's, squi it. it's the same batch, is it? Same not, batch, yeah. Not as squishy as I'd expect for a washed rind. But you were saying to me it's not really a washed rind yeah. cheese. Is it? See, this is where it falls a little bit. Uh, this is where we struggle a little bit with Bert's cheese and how, uh, Bert, drunken Bert, so how to call drunken Bert, because it isn't a typical washed rind cheese. 
Mm. We're not just relying on the bee linens, you know, we're not just relying on that wash to change the surface. We've kind of encouraged a little bit of slightly different bacteria to grow, but essentially it is a mold, a mold ripened cheese rather than a washed dried cheese. So it could benefit from a little bit more age, but it will, it probably won't ever go like a sort of a, a washed. A like gooey washed, washed rind, yeah, because I think we talked about it yesterday or the day before, didn't we? That it's not, it's perceived as a, because of the name Drunken Burt, but it's actually, yeah. it's more of a mold ripened cheese more than a mold washed rind. rind. How do you describe it on your website, young lady? <laughs> many, many descriptions. Uh, I think we ended up with an un, an unspiked or an unpierced blue cheese. Right. Okay. Inside yeah. it. <laughs> now you've done Very your lovely cheese. You should have all the options, shouldn't you? Yeah. Um, Claire's loving the idea of pickled pears. Uh, Simon is saying, I think the fourteen weeks makes a better after dinner cheese, and the eight week cheese is better as a lunchtime cheese. I like your style, Simon. That yeah. you're eating cheese for every meal. I like that too. <laughs> you, we are new best friend. Having you, Claire, you've just come back from France and it's amazing. They eat cheese for breakfast yes. and dinner. And it, it's just part of quite do it for breakfast. <laughs> our, 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 our desire for the Academy of Cheese is to get that culture into the British yeah. culture that cheese is something that they learn about from infant school from nursery and it's embraced but we've got a long way to go but we're five okay. years in now with the academy five years in and throw a pandemic into that we're not doing too bad I think we're up to nearly 4,000 people have trained with us so wow. which is amazing yes amazing. so thank you to everybody that supports us and has trained with us um Right, Simon's got another question. I think this might be the last question now, guys. Uh, are you going to stay as effective as a effectively a small batch producer? I think that there are always concerns in terms of larger producers changing recipes to make larger volumes to suit bigger retailers. Yeah. It depends how much money your husband's going to give you, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. no, <laughs> how many think... more promotions he gets? Um, I think for us. You know, we've been doing it 12 years now and there has been the odd carrot dangled in terms of scaling up. But okay, you know, that's not why I started making cheese. And I think there's still, for us, a, you know, there's still an export market. You know, there's still lots of other opportunities to grow a business, um, and not necessarily through just just through volume to supply into a to a big multiple. That would not. No, I don't have any ambition no and I think that's the lovely thing you're one of those cheesemakers that I really admire because you stick to your guns and you say well I'm quite happy with the size of my business and the amount of cheese yeah. I make and I'll it's my business and I don't need to have that stress of no. production or trying to find sales when the sales drop off or I know and you're right it would ultimately change the cheese because we wouldn't be able to pierce by hand we wouldn't, you know, be able to hand ladle. We'd have tipping vats. We'd have, we'd probably have to change the shape from a colander to a straight sided. And yeah, it would yeah. be a very different beast. <laughs> it would. So Claire, just before, I'm just going to uh, finish up now, but Claire, thank you so much. And Claire, before when we were chatting, um, has agreed to do a blog about a cheesemaker's view of studying with the Academy of Cheese. So we'll get that out and watch this space for that because I think it's always interesting because cheesemakers do think, oh, they know it all and I'm a cheesemaker, so I don't need to do any, any more studying or, um, well, a few of them. But uh, it is, you know, you've learned lots, haven't you? I have, and I really enjoyed it. I think it's, sometimes you you know you don't necessarily talk to other people that have different opinions on or different backgrounds of cheese so like you're saying consumers and you know Patrick is a font of knowledge of you know but his his perspective is different to my perspective so it's I think that's a is a really good opportunity to, to yeah to learn yeah and I think actually nowadays after we've all been through rubbish times pandemic -y times and whatever People mm. want to do something for their own self-development. So even if you come on a course and it's all right, it's in the topic of your work and your job, you're going to learn and meet other people that is for your own self-development, isn't it? Yeah, I, I 
I took a lot from the course. I really did. And I think and I took that with me to France on holiday and took yeah. my with Jesus and <laughs> I was determined Check to work it. my way through. Check out Claire's Instagram and Facebook pages, guys, because uh, she took some amazing photographs of French cheese. I was mouth-watering. Yes, um, so thank you for doing that, and thank you for thank you for taking part tonight. I hope everybody's oh, enjoyed. I really apologise about the chat, um, the 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 chat problem. I don't know. I think it's a setting when we've set up the webinar. So. Um, I'll check that out. But brilliant, all the questions in the um, in the Q and A. I'm just going to quickly check. We've got one minute. Um, lots of people saying thank you, Claire. No, no, thank. Well, thank you for everyone. Nice. Well, coming along, and thank you for buying the boxes. And yes, thanks. <laughs> amazing cheese. <laughs> no, and um, great. And we'll see you soon because uh, Claire's going to do a slot for Big Cheese Weekender as well, I hope, as a supporter of the Academy. Yeah. Um, and uh, lots and lots of things coming up. So thank you, Claire. And thank, thank you, everybody from around the world for joining us this evening. It's brilliant. <laughs> Bye, all. Bye-bye. Take care.